Supernova, you've been in the news a bit recently. There was a, a supernova went off in M95 uh, last week. And in fact, we've made a couple of videos for Deep Sky Video talking about that particular supernova. So this is the star which then blew up as supernova 2012 AW. Uh, but that's led into sort of more general questions about what a supernova actually is, and particularly the symbols we use for defining a supernova. Um, and this supernova that went off last week was a Type 2 supernova. Uh, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about what a Type 2 supernova actually is. So the symbol for type 2 supernova is SN for supernova and then 2 in Roman numerals. So it's not a very exciting symbol, I'm afraid. So it's got a 2, mm -hmm. which implies to me there's a 1. There are, yes. It's the classic thing that astronomers like doing is that they like classifying things. And actually, usually the way this works, we end up classifying things before we understand what they are. So often the classifications have no real physical significance to them at all. The main difference between type 1 and type 2 supernovae um, is all on the, based on the spectra, and when you analyze the spectra of these things, so you break the light up into the, the colors of the rainbow, you see these characteristic absorption bands due to the various different chemical elements. And in type 2 supernovae, you find these very strong absorption lines from hydrogen. Uh, and in type 1 supernovae, you don't. So the classification really was that basic observational thing of when I see an exploding star, does it have these absorption lines from hydrogen in it or not? So there's, there's sort of fundamentally different processes going on. Uh, I mean, they're both exploding stars, the type 1 supernovae mostly look like they're probably sort of white dwarf stars that just sort of get tipped over an edge so they keep accreting matter until they get too massive and then they collapse. Type 2 supernovae are just uh, stars that have reached the end of their lives, very massive stars reach the end of their lives. And you've got to have an energy source at the center of a star to counteract the effects of gravity. Basically, gravity is trying to pull everything inwards all the time, and you need something in the center to stop that collapse. And of course, when a star is going through its lifetime, it has these various sources of nuclear power, nuclear fusion going on in the center. But eventually, all those nuclear fuel sources run out. And when a massive star reaches that point, and you've no longer got anything to provide that energy source in the middle, the center of the star just basically collapses down. So you have what's known as a core collapse supernova, that the center of the star collapses under gravity. Well, that sounds all well and good, Professor, but that's just something collapsing. Supernovas are these super bright, amazing explosions. That's the weird thing, right? It's actually the, what powers a supernova is this collapse, but of course what you actually see is stuff getting flung out. And so the obvious question is how something collapses can then cause an explosion, right? Things actually uh, flying outwards. And actually the process, the details of the process are not that well understood still, even today, in that for example, part of what drives that outward expansion is neutrinos, right? these almost massless, pathetic little particles in the universe that usually just go streaming through everything. That core collapse actually generates huge numbers of neutrinos, so most of the energy of a supernova explosion is actually in neutrinos. And somehow those neutrinos then transfer their energy to the outer layers of the star to make it explode outwards. And it's not trivial how that happens because neutrinos typically don't interact with things very much at all. But somehow, sort of 1% of the energy of the neutrinos has to get transferred to that outer envelope to drive it outwards. So the, the fundamental question is here is how something collapsing can actually lead to an explosion. How it is that something falling in on itself can actually lead to something actually being flung out into space at high speed. And the way this works is that the bit that gets flung out into space is quite a small part of the star. And you can actually transfer the energy from the collapse, collapsing large part of the star to this small part of the star and actually get it to fly out into space. And there's a classic demonstration for this. So I have a football and a tennis ball. I'm just, all I'm going to do is balance one on top of the other and I'm going to drop them. And you can think of these as two bits of the star, a big bit of the star and a little bit of the star that are collapsing under gravity. And eventually the collapse stops and the collapse stops very suddenly when this thing turns into a neutron star. And that sudden stop will then transfer energy to this smaller part of the star and fling it out into space. Okay, so here we go. If I just drop the two in contact with one another, oh. you actually end up transferring a lot of energy to the smaller part of the star. And it, it, you get this counterintuitive thing that you're used to when you drop something, the height it comes back up to is either less than or equal to the height that you dropped it from. But because you're transferring energy in this way, you can actually end up with the little bit getting flung far further than it fell from in the first place. Oh. <laughs> Oh, well done. In the bin. In the bin. <laughs> it's really only massive stars that, that end their life in this way. Um, so the type 2 supernovae, typically a star's got to be around eight solar masses or above to, to, to go through this process and end up exploding as a supernova. I mean, sometimes it goes really well. We will hit the ceiling in a second. If a star is over this threshold, is it inevitable that it will supernova? I think so. I, 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 
it's a very good question and I don't know a, a definitive answer to it. It's possible there might be ways, so really you need to end up with a star that has quite a lot of mass at the end of its life. If there's some process that makes that star lose that mass before it gets to the end of its life, then it won't explode as a supernova. So any star that sort of ends its life as a massive star will blow up as a supernova. But if there's some process by which a star can kind of lose weight during the course of its life by interacting with other stars, those kinds of things, then maybe it can avoid this fate. Yeah, well, type 1, somebody else has to be involved, right? It's not just the, the natural end to a star's life. In that type 1 supernovae, you're, it's, it's a, a white dwarf star is accreting material and goes over some magic limit. Now, in order to do that, to go over that mass limit called the, the Chandrasekhar mass, you have to have a source of mass from somewhere, which almost always means there's a companion star in orbit around it, which is having material ripped off and falling onto the, onto the, the white dwarf star to tip it over this edge. So uh, type 1 supernovae seem to be always associated with binary stars, where there's an extra source of, of mass to, to tip the star over this edge, whereas type 2 supernovae can be isolated stars that have just naturally reached the end of their lives and blown up. Every time we make a video about supernova, we inevitably get comments under the YouTube video about a star called Betelgeuse. Uh, so Betelgeuse is a relatively nearby star. It's probably the closest star to us that's in danger of blowing up as a supernova. Supposedly, it, I mean, it's somewhere in, in these final phases of its life, right? and so it will indeed blow up. But the timescales involved, although they're short for a star, are long for humans. We're talking you know, tens, hundreds of thousands of years. So it probably will blow up sometime in the, few, uh, you know, the next few hundred thousand years' time, which in, in the grand scale of astronomical timescales is at the blink of an eye. But of course, in terms of human timescales, that's quite a long way into the future, quite likely. It would be quite dramatic if it did go. You'd be able to see it during the daytime. Um, but I don't think it would cause us any particular harm. Could it happen in our lifetime? It could do, but then it could happen any time in the next 100,000 years as well. So it's pretty unlikely it will happen. Oh, that'd be cool. Make a great video, wouldn't it? It'd be brilliant, yeah. <laughs> you know if it happens, I'll be straight on the phone to Absolutely. you. Absolutely. All right. <laughs> so here's the whole of the uh, Hubble Space Telescope image. It's this sort of rather strange shaped field of view just because of the detectors in this particular camera uh, in the Hubble Space Telescope. So if we didn't zoom in on that little bit, so it's before the supernova blew up. So there's the red blob we had before. This is the zoom in on that area, and this is the error circle of where that supernova is likely to have been. So this is the star which then blew up as supernova 2012 AW.